Hey, it's episode four of Goal Oriented. I'm your host, Chandler Engelbrett, and I'm joined by... Mason Young. And Austin Curtright. Boys, four weeks in, we have a podcast that's fully going. I can't believe it. I also cannot believe we just survived Manhattan, Kansas. We're not a part of the football team. We survived our own trip and own adventure to Manhattan. It was one of the weirdest experiences of my life. We spent four hours in our photographer, Trey Young's car. He's not the basketball player. Please do not ask us that. But we survived. Mason, Austin, what are our thoughts getting out of the Little Apple? First off, we left uh, the morning of the game, so around 6.30 in the morning, and then went to the game and covered the game and stayed there until like 9 or 10 afterwards. But uh, the drive up there was pretty interesting. It was like we were playing just nothing simulator where we just stared out the window and looked at nothing but grass for four hours and maybe saw like a handful of 10 cars and didn't see a single building for a stretch of like at least two hours. Um, So when they say that there's nothing in Kansas, like there's literally nothing in Kansas. I don't think I've ever been told to shut up more in a car ride than I was on this trip because I was shotgun as Trey was driving. And my belief of shotgun is that you shouldn't fall asleep as the as the driver does. I think that's just a common rule. My only way I can stay asleep is if I'm constantly talking. Um, that caused uh, some hostility to arise in the car. We won't dive into that. That's a little bit too vulgar for this. Mason, you were just on your laptop the entire time. I think you were listening to Garth Brooks there for a long time Jesus. of it. Um, what did you think of the drive? Well, you know, I mean, I thought it was really quaint and peaceful you know just got the opportunity (laughs) to do some work uh when we could get wi-fi or i could be able to use my hotspot but that we that was pretty intermittent so uh, we just rolled with the punches and i honestly remember coming back and having to just like vomit out like four or five different stories and waiting like an hour to get wi-fi so that was cool but uh, uh we get to make the kansas trip one more time this year when we go to the game in lawrence so uh We'll see what that's what that's like. And Mason stole my AirPods. I was freaking out when I got home from the game. I was like, where are my AirPods? You left them in and, the cup holder. And he took them, and he was like, oh, they're in my bag. As I was freaking out, I almost went and bought new ones last yeah, night. I, I see. I, you never mentioned it to me. I didn't know that, it, that they were even missing, and I don't check my bag that often, just like I don't check my email. So, I mean, <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't think that that uh, you were missing them. So. Again, to date this, this is Tuesday. We got back Sunday morning. For the past two days... Austin has been nonstop asking where his AirPods are. He came to me this morning and said, I am this close to buying another set. Not even this close. He was like Googling Raycons or some other off-brand and just went with it. Justin Jane, who's here as well, give me a thumbs up with Raycons. We're not sponsored, uh, but I guess shout out to Raycons, whatever that is. But anyway, um, we're in Trey's car. It's a four-hour drive there, four-hour drive back. But then we watched a football game. The football game is exciting. Uh, We'll talk about that a little bit more in detail. Um, But after the football game, around midnight, we got to experience K-State's version of Campus Corner, uh, which is called Aggieville, Aggie Land, one of the two. Um, I I don't know why. I guess K-State used to be the Aggies. That's my only guess. Uh, We went to Fat Shack. Again, not sponsored. I'm not too sure what Fat Shack was, but that was an experience in and of itself. Um, What did you think of Aggieville? Aggieville was probably the most chaotic place I've ever witnessed. Um, There was just an absurd amount of drunk college students in one area at one time. And um, to be honest, I really did not like it at all. I wanted to get out of there instantly because I was uncomfortable. But right before that, uh, us and our friends with uh, SI Sooners were the last uh, two media groups to to leave uh, the stadium after the game. And all of the gates were closed and locked up. So Chandler and Trey, our photographer, obviously, that we mentioned, um, got to slip through a little cr- like crack in where the the gate was. But me and Mason, on the other hand, just parkoured it and absolutely jumped the fence. Um, so it was kind of a whole weird trip in and of itself. And then, of course, we get back to our car where Trey drove, and someone just broke into his car, left a note telling us that it was an inconvenience that we parked in the wrong spot. Didn't take anything, but just left that note. So that was one of the more wild things that so many weird things were happening at once that I was just like, our lives a simulation. Like, what is going on right now? Mason, did you also climb the K-State fence with Austin? Did you fall? 
No, I did not. Um, <laughs> we took we took we took a couple very different approaches to this. Um, I heard some rumblings that maybe John Hoover from SI might have might have taken a spill in the in the woods behind the stadium. I I didn't fortunately, um, but it was quite a chore to climb over the fence. And then you know, like Austin said, we went to Aggieville. Um, Jason Kersey from the Athletic uh, had been at Fat Shack and he recommended it, and. Uh, I wasn't really impressed. I don't. I don't think I need to go back to Fat Shack anytime soon, to say the least. But overall, good trip. So, um, sorry. This is uh, the podcast producer Justin Jane. I want to say point of clarification. Austin said somebody broke into Trey's car, <laughs> and when they told me the story in the newsroom, I assumed that that meant like windows smashing and police reports filed. No. Trey had left his car unlocked, so this person just very, very politely opened the door, rummaged around for a pin, and wrote a passive-aggressive note on his parking pass. That is exactly what happened, and my thing is, one, whoever this person was from Kansas State, I understand that in that moment, you feel like the the guy who's had something wrong done to him, because you, you're, you're going to your normal parking spot, and there's just four schmuck college kids who have taken your spot, and you're thinking, all right, I'm going to make them pay. But how is the answer to that opening their door and finding a pen to write a letter that said, hey, this isn't spot uh, 184. This is spot 203. Thanks for the inconvenience. I think that both sides are in the wrong, and I don't think the answer was to, uh, well, break in. Nothing was broken. Nothing was taken. But that seemed like a stretch. (laughs) The whole reason that we had to park in that spot in the first place is because Kansas State tailgating is absurd there was a crazy amount of people just set up in the parking lot and we couldn't even get to where we were supposed to park because the whole you know turn in was blocked off by people with tents who were drunk at like 11 30 on a saturday morning which is probably like, kind of sick if you're a college <laughs> football fan I, I feel like absurd is is a bit too much those are those fans are, are really really good at what they do i mean they were the entire atmosphere there i thought was great for football um and plus tailgating was everywhere that was an inconvenience our end we were there to do a job um but overall i thought they were nice fans mason you have anything to say about the experience that we've talked about so far no i mean they (laughs) they hit our football they hit our car with a football like as soon as we got there and then uh we went inside and it was cool so but okay we watched a football game ou uh obviously got the win in the end 37 31 um, they uh, had a, I believe, a 17-point lead at one point. Kansas State was able to get back into the game there. Um, something we do post-game every every time is we take uh, questions from social media and answer them in our mailbag. You can read that at OUDaily.com under the sports section. Um, so for this podcast, I thought I'd take a few of those questions and read them here. This is from user Steve Harrison on Twitter, who simply asks, Is OU better than we think? And I'll take this one. I think they are. They're five and zero, undefeated in Big Twelve play. They have a another huge test coming up this week. Um, but I think OU looked more like the OU we know this past weekend. Spencer Rattler played really, really well. Only had three incompletions, um, had a touchdown, and his interception kind of just worked like a punt there at the end. Um, are those numbers that necessarily point you can point to and say, yeah, that's a Heisman winner? I don't think so. But that was obviously the best game this OU offense has played so far, in my opinion, um, definitely against a Power 5 team. Um, So I would say that there's no reason for OU fans to hit a panic button right now. Um, After they make the trip across the Red River, we'll talk about it again. But uh, here's the next mailbag question. Uh, This is from Daniel Garcia, and he says, I'll toss this one to you, Mason, how can OU avoid so many penalties? Well, if you look at the penalties that OU had against Kansas State, and I think I actually broke it down, where there was like, I want to say, three false starts, three holdings on the offensive line, which, I mean, that's stuff that's going to happen. It's just part of football, and it's something you have to deal with. You don't like it, sure, and there's better things that the offensive linemen can do technique-wise to prevent that, but like, it's just going to happen. It's, it's natural and part of the game. Um, the four other penalties that OU had that were weird, um, like illegal block, unnecessary roughness, um, and a couple of unsportsmanlike conducts, the big one was Tyrese Robinson's at the end of the game, uh, towards the end of the game, and then right after that, Kansas State returned kickoff 93 yards for a touchdown. Um, the, the penalties, like, 
The big thing with the penalties is like OU has to just make the the little mistakes like the offensive line penalties or whatever. They can't afford to make the big mistakes like the unsportsmanlike conduct penalties. Um, and if they just play ball and, and don't get worked up about certain situations and, and play clean football, then they're going to be fine. Yeah, I agree with you. I, I think that was just an uncharacteristic penalty performance uh, from the Sooners there. Um, something definitely they'll try to clean up. Uh, going forward. But let's go to the final mailback question. This comes from G. Russell on Twitter. And Austin, why don't you answer this one? It says, what is the biggest position group question mark heading into OU Texas for the Sooners? I think it's pretty obviously just the offensive line in general. I think, you know, that group is still struggling to kind of find its, um, you know, five main starters and like what Mason said, I think seven of seven of their penalties came from that unit itself. And, you know, they played a little bit better against Kansas State at times. And when they did, that's when Kennedy Brooks got going on the ground. That's when Spencer Rattler was able to open up with the play-action game and play his best season of the game. So, you know, they've you know Lincoln and, and Spencer have talked a lot about how the game's one of the trenches. And I think that's, you know, pretty clearly shown so far this season. And again, I agree with you there. Uh, we gave a more detailed answer, again, in our mailbag that can be found on OUDaily.com. Also highlighted the cornerback group for them right now is a little bit banged up, so that's sort of a question mark, uh, especially at this point in the season. Uh, they have a few uh, marquee guys who their status is unclear. Speaking of which, today, again, Tuesday, Lincoln Riley's weekly press conference. Uh, Alex Grinch, of course, is there too. Um, once again, catered by Midway Deli. I got to attend today. I might have skipped class. Uh, Professor Rieger, if you're listening to this, uh, thanks for listening. Um, but what I will toss to Mason, our injury update guy, what was said today by Lincoln about the guys who won't be playing this week? Well, usually we get a pretty definitive injury update from Lincoln Riley today, uh, more or less, not so much. Um, we know that Danny Stutzman, Isaiah Coe, uh, it looked like Justin Broyles got banged up during the Kansas State game as well. Jalen Redman reportedly out with a knee injury. There's there's a handful of guys that we're kind of not sure w- entirely. Stutzman being the exception, we know his arm is is hurt. Coe's looked like a leg injury, and Broyles I think was something rib related. Um, we're we're not really sure what their status are. Lincoln Riley said, you know, we expect to have a few defensive guys back, but can't say anything definitively there. So um, we'll just see how it pans out for OU defense in terms of players that they have available against Texas this weekend. Um, I think one thing that's interesting is like last year against Texas, their depth was really challenged and that was really kind of a, um, a into the fire moment for OU's defense. A lot of guys were like really exhausted, but were saying, coach, keep me in the game. I don't want to come out of the game. So, I mean, even if OU's depth is kind of challenged this weekend, I still expect the defense to string together a good game solely on, the principle of just continuing to fight and battle. So, I agree. Um, Austin, you were also there. You had a – what was the Midway Deli sandwich you had today? It was like chicken. Turkey and provolone. Oh. That's the one I get every time. And I steal Mason's mayo because he just <laughs> eats it plain or doesn't like sub sandwiches or cold cuts or whatever. The weirdest, like, take ever is, like, not liking a, a sandwich, but okay. Just give me chips and a cookie and I'll be fine. Like, it's okay. Now, what, what really stinks is, like, they've taken away the soda and we just have water now. So oh, darn. So that's, that's my pet peeve. But, uh. And I, I know that's Austin's pet peeve, too. He just doesn't want to put that on the record. So Anyway, what else was said at the presser today, Austin, that yeah, you took note of? I think there was pretty telling things from the defense. Obviously, he talked pretty extensively about stopping B. John Robinson, Texas's pretty much Heisman candidate running back now, who's second in the country in rushing yards and just came off a game against TCU with 37 total touches, who they're clearly um, is the you know main focus of that offense. But... Um, you know, he talked. They he was talked about, you know, being someone that's gonna, you know, provide a lot of trouble for that group. And something I I thought Grinch said that was, um, you know, really sort of telling was after the Kansas State game, he talked about, you know, thinking that some of his players didn't care about practicing, and that's what led to 
freshmen like DeMont Harmon and Jordan Mukes playing in spots that they have not seen all season I mean, late in the third quarter against Kansas State when the game was still pretty close. But yeah, I, I'm right there with you. About this game is every year there's there's so many storylines, and, and this year obviously is no exception. Obviously you have the return of the Texas State Fair and a full-capacity crowd uh, that'll be in, in Dallas at the Cotton Bowl for this game. Um, I think that's just going to add a lot more. You know, when you look at last year's matchup it went to four overtimes post game uh i talked to joel clatt about that game and he said that that was one of the most upsetting experiences he's ever had watching a game because of how crazy and how unprecedented that game was it deserved a full crowd i don't know if this year's game will be better uh i certainly hope so i i hope it's a it's a game that we can watch and it's just a competitive and fun time like it always is but that game last year just stands alone in history, in my opinion, as one of the better Red River games. Uh, but let's talk more about the storylines. Obviously, the State Fair is back, Mason. What do you think about that? Yeah, you know, it's really interesting. I've never experienced uh, the Texas State Fair on my own. In fact, my trip to the Cotton Bowl last year for the reduced capacity no State Fair game was kind of my first experience with the Cotton Bowl. So I'm really interested to see what the parallels are like uh, as it compares to last year. And for me... Um, I think it would be preferable if this game wasn't four overtimes like it, like it was <laughs> last year because uh, I like to uh, get out and enjoy the, the fair a little bit. But maybe we'll do that Friday night in advance when we drive down and uh, uh, we won't have to worry about that on, on game day. But it's going to be a heated contest nonetheless, and uh, it's always overly hot weather <laughs> than what you'd expect for October. So we'll see how it goes. I can't think of a better group of three people to talk about the Texas State Fair experience, knowing that none of us have ever been there at the State Fair for this game. Justin, you've been to a Texas State Fair before. Video editor, what do you think? Yeah, um, well, I'm just going to say, first off, um, as as great as last year's game was, I do not have enough camera battery for four overtimes. So <laughs> purely from a coverage standpoint, I hope that it lasts less than that. Um, I went to the Texas State Fair as a child with my dad to go to the OU Texas game Two or three times, and each year I would pick a different fried food to try. Ooh. Fried Pop-Tart, f- chicken fried bacon one year. Um, it, it's a very, like, it, I think it's got to be the most unique environment in college sports, honestly. Like, you can take your Rose Bowls, you can take your Jerry Worlds, but at the end of the day, when you have big techs greeting you for this giant football game, and there's, fit like... Even if you're not a football person, you're going to love the environment because it smells like funnel cake and beer and everybody is like going to be hot and dying, but also have a good time. Um, And it's just, it's a truly unique environment. They split the field like right in half, Texas and OU fans. And um, freshman year I went and my roommate got the potluck tickets right behind the Texas bench. And that was the year that Kyler Murray and uh, Sam Ellinger were having a shootout. And so anytime Texas was up, the Texas fans were turning around and yelling at OU fans. <laughs> and anytime OU scored, OU fans were yelling at Texas fans on the bench. And I've just never been to a football game where that's happened before. I think it's you know even more interesting is just so many clashing groups of people there's going to be people that are just there for the fair because it's a saturday people just there for the game uh and then you know there's also college game day that's going to be there so it's obviously going to be an overwhelming atmosphere with so many different things happening at at once i'm personally a huge state fair guy i go to oklahoma state fair every year it's obviously not the texas state fair so i'm very excited uh like justin said i did have a bacon wrapped um grilled chicken at the Oklahoma State Fair this year. It was very good. I'm definitely going to be trying some weird fried food, and it'll probably take me an annoying amount of time to figure out what I'm going to end up buying. You know, we were just joking before this podcast about I'm kind of the resident newsroom guy that only eats pizza and chicken, and I'm expected because of that to not live very long. But uh, <laughs> I'm going to I'm gonna live Friday night with uh, some chicken fried bacon, like Justin mentioned, sounds pretty good. So we're definitely going to see what's up with the Texas State Fair for sure. Just for some background on that, I don't think I've ever had a meal with Mason that wasn't pizza or chicken. Like, I literally cannot think of a single time. It's the two quintessential food groups. It's <laughs> it's really all you need to survive. So, I think I'm most looking forward to just the bucket of fries 
Who gets fries in a bucket? Why is that even an option? Who doesn't love a bucket of fries? Who doesn't love plug OU in 60? I say that very line on the show. Um, but yeah, that should be fun. But then there's a football game also going on, and I think this will be probably one of the um, closer to call. I mean, right now I feel like both OU and Texas fans have no idea what they're getting into uh, this Saturday. Uh, I believe the line is OU favored by a field goal. That's right. Yeah, something like three and a half. So okay. it'll be very interesting, um, and especially from the perspective of Texas quarterback is Casey Thompson, who um, used to play at Southmore High School and then Newcastle High School here near Norman. He's played against a bunch of OU guys like Pat Fields from Tulsa and, and Drake Stoops from Norman, and it's going to be really interesting to see for the first time ever a kid from Oklahoma playing quarterback for Texas against the Sooners. Yeah, I don't know if that's ever happened before at the quarterback position. I'm sure there's players that have gone from Oklahoma to Texas, but never on this magnitude. So we uh, we talked to Lincoln Riley about that today at the press conference, and Casey Thompson is a guy that you know Lincoln recruited and you know, wanted to come play for OU and follow in the footsteps of his his dad and even his brother. Um, and obviously that didn't go the way Lincoln Riley probably preferred it to go. Um, but we we talked to him about it, and he was. I asked him if he was kind of surprised at the fact that Casey Thompson didn't outright win the quarterback battle at the beginning of the season. That instead went to Hudson Card, and he was just as surprised as everybody. But he wasn't surprised that Casey Thompson had worked his way back into that role, has taken over Texas offense, and is you know doing as well as he is. I think they dropped what seventy on Texas Tech two weeks ago. Uh, last week against TCU, they didn't put uh, up those type of numbers, but obviously he keeps the ball moving and keeps defenses you know, guessing all day. Uh, Austin, what do you think else about what's going on the field uh, this Saturday? You know, I think Casey has sort of probably solidified himself as that starting spot. Again, something I found interesting is Hudson Card had been the holder previously, um, and you know he did, actually did not hold their field goals last week against TCU because that would have... I'm not sure if it's related, but that would have exceeded his redshirt capability um, for the four-year threshold that that is. But um, but just in general, I'm a Norman guy. I went to Norman North, so Jake Stoops is a year older than me. <laughs> I watched Jake Stoops and Casey Thompson go at it a few times. Um, it was it was a fun time, but I, I just think it's really interesting that obviously Casey Thompson's dad, Charles Thompson, ran the wishbone at OU, then his brother Kendall, who later I think made a – NFL roster as a receiver after transfer after transferring to Utah, but he was a former quarterback at OU as well under Stoops. So you know it's it's just so interesting the fact that he is so connected to this OU roster. He's played against most of the guys on this roster that are from Oklahoma that play for the Sooners, and now that he's he was offered by Lincoln, I think I found an old archived picture of, earlier today of Lincoln Riley watching. Casey play at a sophomore game so it's just super interesting to know how many different connections he has to this team and now he's you know everyone he's known is sort of not rooting against him but on the other side of this rivalry this is just a podcast full of shout outs at this point but here's another Casey Thompson tidbit news editor for the daily Jonathan Kinsel actually tackled Casey Thompson in a high school game one time I don't believe that is that is probably Kinsel's only athletic achievement ever uh he's a good golfer but is that a sport we'll talk about that on a different podcast Pick anyway. some video where it didn't happen right? <laughs> i think kinsel's lying there's <laughs> absolutely no way he was athletic enough to do that anyway let's talk about more moments but let's stick to moments in red river showdown history uh when i was growing up uh you know i watched a lot of ou texas games and this is the game you look forward to every year um you know just as a fan of the sport um this always draws uh, a lot of national attention uh, regardless of how good both teams are like i said moments ago with the game last season both of these teams didn't have a winning record last year and look what they managed to pump out uh in terms of on the field so let's start with mason mason looking back at all the ou texas games what's a moment that stands out to you above the rest uh i think one that really sticks out is adrian peterson's 225 yard performance 2004 his freshman season basically ran over the longhorns as a one-man wrecking crew and led OU to the win in that game, and I think that that really kind of, like, elevated him to where he started getting some Heisman consideration. He obviously didn't win, and that's a another big debacle, but that game really sticks out in my mind um, as one of the outstanding rushing performances in OU Texas history, and there's, there's others, but um, it seems like every year this game comes down to who's going to run the ball more effectively between OU and Texas. Austin? I th- Mr. I think, Norman? I think, think of so many... Um, 
I think of Trey Millard's hurdle, um, which Drake Stoops actually mentioned today as one of his favorite moments. But um, that was that was a fun one. I remember. Um, I do remember um, what year was it? I think 2010, 2009. Sam Bradford came back from injury after the season opener against BYU. Came back and got hurt again, and then Landry Jones came in. Do not remember the outcome of that game. I was probably like nine or ten years old, but <laughs> I do remember that. That was as I first sort of started watching sports in general. So I remember that being like, oh, that's kind of a big deal that Sam Bradford just got hurt. But um, then there's you know, there's ones like DeMarco Murray uh, or like DeMarco Murray flipping into the end zone or Damian Williams taking a 95-yard touchdown run. You know, there, there's so many I think of because, you know, there seems like almost every game in this rivalry, there's, there's one play that you sort of remember. You know, just recently the Kyler Murray – scramble touchdown run that brought OU back within a touchdown with what like four three minutes left so it, there's always some sort of magnificent play 20 years 20 year anniversary of the Roy Williams Superman play as well so right yeah there's there's always a play like that that sort of gets mentioned out neither of you were alive when that happened right is that just uh, no was I was negative six months old <laughs> No, awesome. I definitely wasn't alive either. But uh, no, negative five months old. Let's let's toss it to March. the other only per, the only other person in the room that was alive uh, during that Superman play. Justin, do you have any favorite moments in Red River history? Um, well, two things. Yeah, I was gonna say the Roy Williams moment. If not, uh, because I was one years old, so I don't remember it. But my dad, I would say that's his favorite play in maybe OU history. He would very passionately tell me about that moment <laughs> uh, when we would go to OU games as a kid. Speaking of my father. He was at both of the games that Sam Bradford got injured that year. He, so it's we, his fault. We went to the BYU game because it was that was maybe the first one of the first games in Jerry World, like the new I one. So. Um, and so I remember opting out of that game because I was nine or ten and I didn't care about BYU. Um, and then I remember we were watching the game from the hotel room or something, and uh, it got very bad very quickly. And then I went to that OU Texas game. I believe this was the fried Pop Tart game. <laughs> and yeah, I remember this just like complete look of despair on my father's face when Bradford went down again. And I was like, oh man, in person, he's watching this happen. So are you going to mark, like, like do you have a mark on every game of, like, this is the food I ate at this OU Texas, and, and, and what do you plan to make it for this week's occasion? So here's the thing. I had to do a little research for OU and 60 this week with okay. uh, with the fair foods and stuff. The, the deep-fried peach cobbler soul rolls sound mm. incredible to me. Might have to check that out. Um, so, yeah, I think that might be – I try to get a, dif- a different deep-fried food at each – Texas State Fair. Hey, you heard it here first. This might be the uh, Peach Soul Rolls game. So It's not going to be a good week for calorie counting. I'm, I'm just going to go ahead and throw that out the window. But sticking with favorite moments in Red River history, um, I, I didn't start watching football until like 2011. I was like 12 and then sixth grade. Uh, but along those years, the moment that we haven't mentioned so far that stands out to me, Baker Mayfield's throw to Mark Andrews, 2017. Um, I could just remember that play call. Obviously, there's the iconic photo of Andrews running past the Texas sideline, and you can just see the disappointment the disappointment in the faces of Texas fans. Um, that's, that's something that I can always remember. I was watching that at a friend's house. Uh, they just got a new dog, and I hope that dog's doing well because I've not seen that dog since, uh, and they were a little puppy, and I love dogs. Uh, but that's, that's all I have for OU Texas moments. Uh, going back to this game, Obviously, this is a game, like I mentioned to you earlier, there's a lot of mystery surrounding it. Both teams, even though OU is a, a top six team and Texas is at the near the bottom of the top 25, there's uh, you know just a giant question mark around how this game is going to go. Mason, what are your keys to the game, and what do you see the outcome looking like? Well, a lot is going to be discussed about just containing B. John Robinson and stopping him from doing anything, and the same with Casey Thompson. I think more so my keys is for OU is to get the running game going early and have the offensive line doing its best um, in run blocking. Um, This honestly seems like, and I referenced this earlier, but it honestly seems like this is the game every year where OU really kind of gets the ground game going and its offensive line starts playing its best. Um, I think we definitely saw that last year and they were much better moving forward. Um, what's really interesting is OU is significantly better this year at running back than they were for this game last year. Last year it was a combination of Seth McGowan and TJ Pledger who are no longer 
um, on the team. And, and this year they have Kennedy Brooks, who's a 1,000-yard rusher twice, and Eric Gray, who's an, another talented running back. So if they can get the O-line run blocking straightened out, which I think it was improved against Kansas State, they just dealt with a lot of penalties, um, this could be a really big statement game for OU in terms of what it's able to do to run the ball in order to better open up the deep passes for Spencer Rattler. I'm going to have to agree. I, I think, obviously, the run game is a huge key here. Um, you know, I, I think I think back to the, the offensive line, right, like Mason said, but and, and B. John Robinson. But another thing, you know, has to just be, I, I think a huge key is getting Marvin Mims and Jane Hazelwood the ball. Obviously, OU has a plethora of really talented receivers in its offense, but, you know, I, th- I think Jane Hazelwood and Marvin Mims are, are two guys that, I think Lincoln Riley's just they. I think he has to find ways to get them the ball more. I I think they're two of OU's more talented players on the entire roster. Um, Marvin Mims got a little more uh, engaged against Kansas State. They did a few things trying to get him some bubble screens and stuff. But you know, I, I don't think I've ever seen Jane Hazelwood get tackled on on first touch. So I I just think maybe those two guys um, are are two pretty uh, important pieces. I'm going to say my biggest key for the game, uh, key to the game for the Sooners, is a lot like my key to the game for them last week. It's containing the other team's running back. Obviously, they didn't do a terrific job with covering up Deuce Vaughn the entire time against the Wildcats, but they still did a good enough job to where they could still win the game. Uh, We've talked about them all day. Bajan Robinson is a beast. Uh, Casey Thompson is also one of the more mobile quarterbacks in the Big 12. I think Alex Grinch is going to have a headache at some point Saturday trying to keep them both uh, under, you know, a, a record amount of yards. Um, but I, I think this will be another just great addition of this rivalry. Um, I think it'll be, be one that uh, we all can look back fondly and think, all right, that was a good game. Uh, but before we wrap up here, um, we're going to end today's show with a Justin's mystery question. Like I said, I'm very happy video editor Justin Jane got to join us today. Justin, what's your mystery question today? Okay. I think we're going to have to limit answers to just to single things because we're already a little bit over time. But my question is, in OU offensive history, who do you think, an individual, who do you think would win in a battle royale? <laughs> oh, I think this is the easiest question. This is including coaches. <laughs> this, this is, is okay. including coaches. All offensive players. All offense. Only offense. We can do okay. defense another I think time. it's so clearly Creed Humphrey. Creed Humphrey is winning I, this battle royale. I literally do not think that there's a human on this earth that could probably... Creed Humphrey might quite literally be the strongest player in the NFL. <laughs> I I am inclined to agree with you because I remember, I think when they played Alabama, he got his helmet knocked off in the middle of a play and continued blocking a, an Alabama defensive lineman. Mason, what do you think? Creed, Creed Humphrey's a freak, but I'm going to take... <laughs> I'm going to take Kyler Murray. Um, I mean, I think he's literally just going to outrun everybody in all these instances. So um, he's, like, honestly just one of the more talented athletes ever to come through OU in general. And uh, I think that he would just outpace everybody in an offensive battle. I'm going to go with Travi, uh, Travis Kelsey Light, and that is Blake Bell. Uh, I, I don't think anybody could bring him down. Uh, in a battle royale mode, not even Creed Humphrey. I mean, he made a, a history of running over players at OU. That would be my bet. The belldozer. What do you guys think? Why don't you reply to this uh, anywhere on social media and tell us, who do you think would win an OU offensive battle royale uh, in history? But with that, let's wrap up. Uh, I've been your host, Chandler Engelbrett. You can follow me at CT Engelbrett everywhere online. Mason, how can they follow you? Uh, my Twitter at is at Mason underscore young underscore zero. Hit Austin. me with a follow. Austin, it is at Austin Kurtwright. Easy, simple. Let's go ahead and get Justin here. Justin, how can we follow you? Um, my handle is at Justin underscore underscore Jane, J-A-Y-N-E. Uh, I'm anti underscore, but Justin is definitely a follow. New member of the uh, podcast, you Justin do. Jane. Love that you're here. Thank you so much for listening. We will see you next week. Be sure to follow uh, OUDaily.com and at OUDailySports on Twitter for all your OU football needs. With that, thank you so much. See you next time.